My name is Anna. I'm your host and organizer, but not your presenter. Tonight's presenter is uh, Barry Bird, professor of mathematics and computer science at Drew University. And he'll be talking about functional programming with Haskell. Take it away, Barry. Okay. Um, first things first, uh, please interrupt me at any time. If you don't have a question, make one up and interrupt me because I really like dialogues. Um, it just, it makes me feel like I'm, you know, being heard. Um, interrupt at any time and feel free to turn on your video if it doesn't chew up too much of your bandwidth because that way I kind of feel as if I'm talking to faces instead of names. Um, here we go, the Haskell programming language. It's named after a fellow named Haskell Curry little bit of background, mathematician born in 1900, lived until 1985. I believe he was very much into the formal logic movements of the first half of this 20th century. Um, when they created this language, they wanted to name it after him. They thought of naming it Curry but curry was already taken. There was already a language named curry. So they went to his wife and said, is it okay if we name it after him Haskell? And she said, he hated that first name, but go ahead and do it anyway. <laughs> so that's the background to the name. Let's take a look. Hey Barry, and, are, you, uh, are you sharing your screen? Um, can you see behind me? I can see behind you, but you're just, you're just in the uh, the gallery matrix on my side. I don't, is anybody else seeing that? Well, uh, what I did was I pinned Barry. You can go to um, oh, okay. uh, hover over his image, click on the three dots, and click on pin, and then it'll blow it up. Okay. And if that doesn't work for everybody, there's another thing called view, and view. It's in the upper right hand corner. And I think what that does is there's gallery and speaker. And if you choose speaker, then my image will be, whoever's speaking will be enlarged. And uh, from the three dots, it worked perfectly. That's how yeah. I do. All right. Is everybody good with that? The pin works good. Okay. Anybody still fumbling around with that? No. Okay. Let me know if, the, let me know if, if, if what you see is too small. I'll be happy to, to do something about it. Um, oh, yeah, I don't do shameless uh, um, 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 promotions, but I got to tell you, um, in 1916, I did a complete functional analysis, a functional analysis, functional programming video for Safari Books Online. And uh, it was fun to do. And I like being in front of the camera. So if you want to uh, check that out, there's a pointer to it. And if anybody's interested and you don't have time to write down that enormous number, I can um, put it in the chat or give it to you later. Okay, um, here we go. Um, what's the value of X? And I'm gonna tell you right away, it is a trick question. I think you get an error message. Well, I'm not doing a formal language here. Okay, these are all pseudocode with semicolons. So, um, what that I mean, th th this isn't Haskell. This is just a regular old imperative programming language. What's the value of x? Well, I reckon it's eight, depending on. Uh, it certainly looks like eight. Okay. Does look like eight. Okay, now the reason you're saying that is because you're used to the time dependence quality of imperative languages. The value of X at one point in time is seven, the value of X at the next point in time is eight. That could be very confusing. You have this variable, you have this name X and it changes from one instant to another, right? I'm, I'm Barry right now, a minute later, George is Barry or you know somebody else is Barry. That, that's no way to write a programming language. So what we want out of our programming languages is no mutable variables. 
we don't want the value of X to change from one part of the program to another because it's confusing when that happens. It becomes harder to debug. All right, that's one thing that we don't like about imperative languages. Here's another thing that we don't like about imperative. And by the way, an imperative language is one where it's do this and then do that and then do that and then do this and then change this and then call this function. Hmm. Here's function change in a sort of a pseudocode. What does that function return? So it's going to give you an error because X is not defined. Ah, but maybe X is defined globally. No, it doesn't say that here in this. Uh, yeah, example. let's say it is. <laughs> well, then it'll return the global value of whatever X is. And do we, we know what we, that value is? We do not. We do not. So we're staring at this function and trying to figure out exactly what it does. We can't tell. And the reason for that is because this is an impure function. The behavior of the function depends on the state of the program at the time when it's executed. Another thing that can add confusion to an already confusing world. Um, messing with a variable that is defined and can be manipulated outside of the function is called a side effect of the function. And we don't like side effects. Now, I'm not going to keep my eye on the chat. Anybody who sees something in the chat that looks urgent, um, just yell out and let me know, OK? Um, all right, what about this code? <clears throat> well, Neil said John Samet would be proud, or Jean Samet. Yeah. She didn't like this? I don't know. Or, or, or did she? I mean, she's, she's Fortran, right? No comment, apparently. OK, all right. Uh, what about this? Uh, what don't we like about this? Well, it says impure function modifies the program state. Let me just blurt it out. Um, we don't know what change values does, but we suspect that it takes this thing that's outside of itself, this Z, and makes a change to it. Not only does its value depend on Z, but its value can modify Z. Okay, now we have a function whose life depends on what's around it. Uh, you know, that's um, the psychologists would say that that's a bad thing. Okay. Uh, what does that code print? This code reads and modifies something that's not defined inside of it. It inputs X. X comes from outside the computer. It prints X. It takes that thing that it input and sends it out of the computer and onto the screen. It modifies the state of the screen. So again, this is impure code. This is um, side effects. This is tinkering. This is having functions, like in this case, input and print, modifying the state of the system. We don't want that to happen. Well, and, wouldn't any input statement modify the state of the system? Well, almost. Haskell programmers have a trick for that. And um, let me. Um, it's monads. Have you heard of monads? I've heard of them, but I'm in the dark. Great, mis great myster mystery. Um, monads. Um, Leibniz. Well, yeah. Leibniz wasn't the philosopher Leibniz famous for for monads? Oh, I'm sorry. It's a philosophy, not a math thing. <laughs> well, I, well, I don't, I don't associate with Leibniz. It's a category theory thing. But um, yeah, I mean, I hope I can get to that. Okay. Well, actually, Saunders McLean took the word category from Aristotle and the word monad from Leibniz. So it's a wow. Different. Okay, I didn't know that. Saunders McLean being the discoverer or inventor of category theory. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's fine. And I've said this in other uh, meetings. All category theorists are crazy. 
remember that. And I've met about five of them in my life, and every one of them is like, you know, okay, here we go. Um, well, I like category theory. Okay, all right, okay. Um, how long will it take this to print? Well, let me just answer my own question. Um, I, in a, in a, in a, in certain imperative languages, this would take a long time because it would have to calculate factorial twenty, then factorial nine, divide the two. That that could be time consuming. But if you notice, we're passing one to the function. And if you pass one to the function, all you have to do is return one. So there's really no need in this code to do the calculation of factorial 20 divided by factorial 9. This, if, if, if a language does this, bothers to calculate something that it's not going to need, that's called eager evaluation of expressions. Eager evaluation of expressions can be time consuming. And I'll show you an example later where eager evaluation of expressions is absolutely necessary. So what do we have here? We, we don't like side effects. We don't like having a program state that we have to carry around and that functions can manipulate. We don't like eager evaluation. What do we like? We like pure functions. Pure functions don't talk to the outside except by taking in a parameter and returning a result. That's all a pure function can do. It cannot communicate with a variable that's not one of its parameters, except one that it makes up. And it cannot have any effect on anything outside of itself, except by returning a value. It's a mathematical function in the real sense. We like immutable variables and we like lazy evaluation. I'm going to pause for a minute here and see if everybody's with me. So is is that a common um, or it has a relationship to what people label as lambda functions? We'll get to that. Okay. Lambda functions are lambda functions are actually a cool way of defining a function on the fly and doing algebra with functions. Everybody else, how you doing? Are we okay? George, we okay? Laura, good. Rachel, how you doing? All right, okay. Please stop me if I start going on and on and you get lost. What's good about pure functions? They can be evaluated lazily. They can be evaluated concurrently. Now there's this big bugaboo in programming where you have two functions running at once and they suffer from a race condition. They collide with one another and start messing up commonly used values, variables. That can't happen if each function has its own set of values and only relates to what's handed to it and what it hands back. So you don't have concurrency problems. They can be debugged without regard to context. You don't have to say, well, it's using the value x. What really is the value of x somewhere else in the program? You don't have to worry about that. And really, for efficiency-wise, it can be memoized. And that's not a misprint. Memoized means you're remembering earlier values of the function that you calculated so that you can reuse them later. And if a function is pure, means beginning to sound like a priest. If the function is pure, then you can reliably say that if the value of f of three was 19 earlier, then it will be three now. And so I could reuse the value f of three later on in the program. I can store it for safekeeping and avoid having to recalculate it again. Well, Barry, do you have to like to memorize a function? Do you have to enumerate all possible arguments? Not necessarily. You can memorize the arguments that you've already been forced to calculate. Is this leading up to uh, 
Haskell memoizes by default or auto, or internally or what it's leading up to is that if you define a function the right way then in order to store the values that you've already calculated all you have to do is add one word to your program one word because haskell knows how to memoize if you set it up correctly and it doesn't memoize if you don't ask it to Memoizing is CPU saving and space using. So you get to choose. Is that kind of like a cache? Like a what? Cache. C -A -C -A -P. Um, well, I think other languages implement it as a, uh, as a hash. So is it or, storing or it in active memory rather than into? Oh, where it stores it, I don't know. Um, does it store it in active memory? Depends on your OS, wouldn't it? I' not sure. I'm, I'm not. That might be a that might be an option, and I don't know. Um, I think, like for example, in Python, they you, or if they don't do it, you could do it by implementing a decorator, and then okay. you, you, yeah. would be, you would be responsible for finding storage for for the uh, return I, results. Yeah, um, I did implementation of the knapsack problem in class. And uh, what was it like? Tens of thousands of function calls without memoizing and something like 40 function calls for the same problem with memoizing. So if you know previous values of the function that you calculated, you can make your program much more efficient. So okay. basically yeah. it saves the the re result for every every time it's called so that if it's called again with the same arguments, right, then uh, it doesn't recompute it. And this happens more often than you think in certain problem problems. But uh, so in order to calculate Fibonacci 5, you have to remember what the value of Fibonacci four and Fibonacci three were. Uh, but uh, memoization uh, really doesn't work unless you have an efficient way to quickly get those results uh, returned. Sure. So that's why they usually typically use a hash. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, like I say, I don't know how it's implemented in Ask. I'm just happy that it has. You, know, you do it with just one word. Okay, let's do some notation. Um, pick your poison. Um, on the top here is how you define a function in mathematics. And this is what a function would look like in Python. And this is what it would look like in Java. And this is what it looks like in Haskell. Now, this dash dash optional means you don't have to write this line. So if I just write fxy equals x plus y, I've defined the function, the function f. So dash dash optional is a comment? A line comment, yes. Like a hash in Python? Yeah. Or like a slash slash in Java or C. I only know Python so, so far. Okay, all right. Yeah, um, I won't use comments further. I just wanted to make sure that I showed you this notation. Um, and um, notice there are no, no parentheses here. Um, let me take a look at what my next slide is. Okay, well, next slide is an example. Here's a complete program. I'm not bragging that it's a complete program, just saying it is. I mean, brevity is not the object here. I just want you to know that this is all you, all you need to do. Um, so on the top line, I'm, I'm defining the function f. On the next line, I'm 
printing the value of f when it's applied to 21 and 33. And I've set up the convention in these slides that I put the output of every program in bold. So that's not something that one types. That's something that the computer does when it responds. But anyway, notice no parentheses. This really trips students up. So the parentheses we're using on the second line is just for the print command. Yeah, and you know what? I could have avoided using those parentheses, but I would have needed a dollar sign notation, which does confuse people. And um, so, so I've used parentheses here where I don't need them because that dollar sign notation, I didn't want to open that can of worms. But anyway, um, it's important that you realize that if I had put parentheses around X and Y, I would have messed things up. Is main assigned a value? And if what? so, what is it? Oh, main, main is the name of a variable that is um, always the starting point of execution. Is it assigned a value? And if so, what is the value? The value is whatever is returned by the print function call. And what the, is returned by the print function call? Yes. And again, let me delay discussion of print until later. I, I'll get to it, I promise, if I have enough time. Can, can I just ask you a quick question just so oh, I sure, understand sure. this better? So if we actually had, um, you know, if we actually had the first line, f x y equals x squared plus y squared. And then if we had main print f three, four, we would have actually had output 25? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, now this would be another way of writing, although you wouldn't catch real Haskellers doing this. But the point is that function evaluation has very high precedence, which means that what's really going on here is F is being applied to 21. And that thing in red, F21, is then being applied to 33. So F21 is a first class citizen in this language. It is a function which, when you apply it to a number like 33, adds 21 to that function. And now the notion that you can apply a function to what we think of as one of its arguments and obtain from it a new function that takes the remainder of the arguments that's sort of called Curry, named after Haskell Curry. So the idea that you can take a function that you think of as being many arguments and instead make a successive chain of functions of one argument each, that's currying. That happens by default in this language. Let me take a look at what my next slide is. Yeah, the, let, me, let me show a very close relative of currying called partial evaluation. Is it, is it recursive then? Um, not yet. Okay. It, it certainly will be because we don't have any loops. Well, I mean, it's only going once to the 21, but if, if it was a more deeper thing, yeah. Okay. Then, then, you, then you could, what I'm doing, well, take a look at this example. This might, might, might clarify this question. So f is a function that adds two variables. g is the partial evaluation of f on the number 21, right here. And you can see where I point, right? Yes. So now, if I apply f to 21 and 33, I get 54. But now g is a first class citizen. It's a brand new function that we get as a result of applying F to 21 alone. And so when I apply G to 33, again, I get 54. 
So, so currying takes a function and gives you another function with perhaps fewer arguments. With one fewer argument. And that way, each of the arguments is separate. And each of the arguments can be piled on one after another to get partial evaluation. So basically troubleshooting would be easier than because you have intermediate values? Yes. And you can define, you can handily define what would it be if I decide temporarily that I always want to apply 21 as the first argument? Well, I have a new name for that. It's G. Yeah, make the life easier for the support guy, but people there really- There you are. Hey, that's good. That's good. <laughs> now, now notice, notice that G is a variable. So G is a variable that stores a function. Functions are first class citizens. So if you omit the parameter 21, yeah. is that an error? If you omit the parameter 21, then G is identical to F. You're just saying G is another name for what you defined F to be. And what about in the print statement where you have G and 33? What if you that, omit that would, that, over there? That would be an error because G applied to 33 would be a function. It would be the same as F applied to 33. And while that's a value, it is a function, it's not something that can be printed. You can't, there's, there's, no, there's no way to turn a function definition into a string without some extra equipment. So if you see something that appears to be a function, the application of a function someplace in a program somewhere, you really don't know how many arguments it expects. Um, if you're not giving it the right number of arguments, you will hear from Haskell. Meaning you'll get, you, you, if, if you give anything the wrong number of arguments, Haskell will waste no time in sending you an error that points you to where the problem is and why you have it. Well, but what I mean is that if you're trying to read somebody else's code yeah. and you don't know whether the code is correct or incorrect, you can't tell by looking at the code whether G is supposed to operate on one argument or two arguments or 47 oh. arguments. Well, let me go back a sec. Wait, would, would, would the error that he's describing be a compilation error, though, so it wouldn't compile or, or, or it wouldn't run? It certainly wouldn't compile and it, and it wouldn't run. Take a look at, the, at, the, at this line here. Now that's optional, right? I could, but I could put that in here. I could say, I could write here, G double colon int arrow int. So I can add to my program a line that informs any reader what kind of value g is, that it is a function that takes an int and returns an int. I could add that to the code. It would not be a comment. It would be something that the compiler checks to make sure I've used g correctly. I, I've, I think I lost track of who's asking the question, but have I answered it or addressed it? Yeah, it was my question and it's been addressed. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. Now we get to the cool stuff. Um, <laughs> notice this. Uh, that's a variable name. Um, I just made it up. I called it sum prime because there's already a sum function defined, but you can have primes and variable names. Right? Remember, it's the mathematical world that came up with this stuff. So here's a list of numbers. And now recursively, I'm saying 
how do you take the sum of any list? Well, if you're starting off with nothing, then the sum of the things in it is zero. Otherwise, you take the first element of the list and you recursively add it to the sum of the remaining elements of the list. Recursion, recursion, recursion. There are no loops in this language. And I guess at this point, my students kind of go, oh no, recursion. That's very powerful. I, I, I think what I wanna say here is, if you're familiar with recursion, then I hope you understand what I'm doing here. If you're not familiar with recursion, probably don't press on this too much because recursion is for unless you have unless you have time to spend on it when you first see it, it's it's not an easy subject. So I'm going to ask who's uh, who's familiar with recursion here. I'm familiar. Got Ron, who else? In my dictionary, it says C recursion. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do Towers of Hanoi back in the day. There you are. There you are. So the idea is, how do you find the sum of my list? Well, you take three and you add it to the sum of the new list five to six. Hey, wait a minute. How do you find the sum of the new list five to six? Well, you take five and you add it to the sum of the new list to six. Hey, wait a minute. How do you take the sum of the new list to six? Well, you take two and you add it to the sum of the new list six. Hey, how do you take the sum of the new list six? Well, you take the number six and you add it to the sum of the empty list. So you just work your way backwards, right? until you get to a point where you don't have to take a sum in order to find a sum. There's a comment uh, from Frank. You need to place a check to make sure there is no limit. There is a limit or end. Yeah, that's this part. Yeah, with recursion, otherwise it can go on forever. Yeah, if you don't have a base case, that's why... then you're in big trouble. Can I ask one quick question? Uh, sure. Again, with respect to Python, that's my only world. Yeah. Uh, head and head and tail are the first, well, first specified number of records in in a in a uh, database, right? So here, head my list means just the first uh, member of the list. Yes. Okay. Now, if I were teaching a course, then I would emphasize this point: the head of this list is just the number three. Just the number three, not a list containing three. Right, right. The tail of the list is a list containing five, two, and six. Thank you. Okay. And by the way, whoa, I have it down here. The head of my list is three, just the number. The tail of my list is a brand new list. Right. And when I add it all together, I get 16. Thank you so much. All right. So you, you get some magic keywords, uh, head and tail. Is there also support for uh, list slicing? All over the place. Okay. Yeah. There's, there's init, there's last, there's just you name it. So, so, so the print would just print the, the, the first tail. It wouldn't go down and print every tail. Right. Or every head. Okay. Right. And that's what it's doing here. Right. Yeah, head head and tail are not going to do anything recursive unless you use them in a recursive expression. Um, Just doing Barry? head. And tail, excuse me, this. Yeah, I was yeah. wondering. So, uh, Barry. Uh, uh, yes. So J Jeffrey asked you a good question about. Uh, recursion is great to add, to to add, to add up a list until you have millions of elements. Uh, then you blow up this text. So what? How can we fight with millions uh, of elements in the list? 
when we try to add them over here. I'm sorry, I, I didn't. Can you can you say that a little slower? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, what? Uh, how? Yeah. Or I can say it. I'm the one who asked yeah, sure, the question. Sure. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, I mean, normally in an iterative language, you you don't need to allocate memory or stack space. You add up a list. You just iterate through the list, and you can do that in constant space. But if you have uh, unlimited number of elements in your list, then you're going to have to make a new function call for every element and make another uh, entry in the stack, another stack frame right. on your stack. So how, so that's going to be unfeasible for large lists. That's what the optimizing compiler is for. Well, there, there's also the same argument pops up in JavaScript and JavaScript came up with this thing called uh, stack tailing where the compiler figures out whether it needs to grow the stack or just rewrite it uh, when doing recursive calls. I'm going to guess that Haskell has something similar. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. OK. All right. OK, I'll have to figure out how to look up how that Yeah, I, I honestly do not know the details, but oh, I know no, that. Don't, don't need to go into it here. But once, once you once you get under the hood, you're no longer talking about functional yeah. programming. You're talking about the sneaky things that a compiler can do. Um, okay, now there are these things called tuples, and uh, here's a tuple with two arguments, two things in it. Tuples are ordered, so 42 comes before 21, and here's a three tuple. And notice the tuples do not need to be homogeneous. So I can have a string and a number and a Boolean in a tuple. And uh, yeah, OK, all right. Where did I use tuples? I, I thought I was using tuples very soon, but let me just see where I am. And OK, this is a good slide anyway. Uh, let's go back to this one, right? If any list equals empty list, then zero. Otherwise, find the head of any list and the sum of the tail. Well, this is called pattern matching. This is another way of doing exactly the same thing. And I call this function sum prime prime, just because I want to show off the fact that I use primes in variable names. The sum of the empty list is zero. The sum of a list whose head is x and whose tail is x's, that's supposed to be like the plural of x. That's the way you could, you could call them anything you want, but it's common to call them x and x's, is you take x and you add to it the sum of the values that come after it. And that's a more compact notation for doing exactly what I did two slides ago. I see, see Deva nodding. That's okay. Yeah. So this is the reason why I wanted to kind of learn the syntax for this, for Haskell. I mean, I, I understand the basic concepts of functional programming, but it's the syntax and getting all the like nuances of like, why did they choose round brackets with the colon thing in there? And like, what does that actually mean? Can, is that a syntax that's used elsewhere? Oh, the reason the round there? brackets are there is because of the precedence rules. This is, if I had a nickel for every time I made this mistake, if you don't have the round brackets there, it's going to take some, try to take some prime prime of X. And that's okay to do, but then you'll end up with a type error when they try to apply that to X's. So because of the precedence rules, I need to group X and X's. Does the pattern matching uh, where it says X's, uh, does that include uh, things of quantity one? So if I had just three, five here, then X would be three. And X's would be the list containing only five. Okay, so that is my real qu question. So the, uh, unwrapping the syntax here. So the brackets are for precedence, and the X, the colon notation then means head tail. Is that right? Um, for a list. 
Yes, is, yes, 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 yes. Okay. Is that the operator for concatenating a, a list, an element? See, that's, on that's what used to be called Pre a list of arms. Prepending pre uh, onto a list. It, it means the thing before it is one single value. The thing after it is a list. And this okay. prepends this to the list. Okay. And if you see so, this pattern, then you can do this with it. Thank you. So that second, the, the thing after the colon, the axis, does it... You said it matches a list containing one. Does or a list it containing nothing. List con so it'll match a list containing nothing. Yeah, it can. And in so, that case, this so thing means find the sum prime prime of the empty list. And then it says, oh, I know how to do that. So it's not going to match the empty list because X is empty. So, so if I fed this thing, just the list containing three, just one element three, then this would be the number three, and this would be the empty list. And, and so, so it would add three to whatever the empty list's sum is. So how come it doesn't match in both cases? In other words, if X's can match an empty list, why can't X match an empty list? Because, X uh, because the rule is that the order of these two statements matters. So if oh, one matches, it's like a case statement with, with automatic, uh, right. automatic break. Uh, the way I understand this is that the syntax of this colon operator, it means that the thing on the left is an element and the thing on the right is a list of that element type. But, and then it can do the pattern matching. So this, in this case, this is gonna be three. So, so that's, that's a shorthand for, those, for the head and tail. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. what I think it looks like that. Right. Yeah. And when you get down to the bare bones, when you get down close to the base case, this X is, is the empty list. And then it says, well, how do I do this? And now, once again, it says, does this match it? Oh, yeah, it does. So, I mean, if I took this statement and put it after here, everything would blow up. Let me march on because I want to make sure that I don't uh, go on until midnight. Um, is everybody's patience still? Are we? I mean, we probably planned on an hour, right? But I think I'm okay. Yeah. Anna, you're in charge. Am I all right? I'm fine with it. I think if anybody feels that they need to go, uh, they should do that without guilt. But uh, I Absolutely. would encourage people to stay I, I, uh, if you can. Why not? That's what students in my class do. So anyway, all right, here we go. Um, wild cards. Um, if you don't need to have a variable, then don't, don't name one. If I have a five tuple whose first element is X and whose third element is Y, then I want to end up with a two tuple X, Y. So here I have such a thing. First element is one, the third element is three. When I apply drop sum to that, I end up with a two tuple. Wild cards. Oh, now. If there's such a thing as a holy trinity for functional programming, this is it. Map, filter, and fold. Here are three three tuples. I'm the CEO and I make a million dollars a year. Jane is the chairman of the board, she makes 200,000. And Joe is an employee and he makes 50,000. Here's a list of employees. I want to find the sum of the executive salaries, the executive salaries, the executives are, are Barry and, and Jane. Now, if you were doing this in an imperative program, 
you would go through a bunch of lists, uh, loops, and a bunch of if statements, or maybe just one loop and a bunch of if statements. But, in, but functional programming, and this, this is true in most languages nowadays, even the imperative ones, have these functions that Haskell calls map, filter, and fold. Now, if I map, now let's do filter first. I'm going to apply the filter function to the function is exec on employees. And the is exec function takes a three tuple and gives me true if that person's position is not employee and false otherwise. So to find all the non-employee, you know what? I shouldn't have named this employees. I think there's something else there. Um, this is a different word than this. This, the, or let's change this word. He's not an employee. He's a, I don't know, low-level person. Okay. So is exec yields true if I've got an employee and false otherwise. And this is the not not equal sign. Now what I'm going to do is filter using the is exec function all of these fellows. And what I'll end up here for execs is a list that contains only Barry and Jane. Joe is out of it now because his position is employee. Here, this, this, this word that I shouldn't have used. Now, what am I going to do next? I'm going to map. I'm going to find to find a salary function that takes a three tuple and gives me the last value. And the map function that applies this salary function to anything in the list. So what that gives me is not a list of executives anymore, but a list of salaries. And now with fold, I could do this easily with just the sum function, but I want to just show you here what fold does. Fold takes a function, which in this case is addition, and an initial value, and applies it to, in this case, all the executive salaries. And that's how I get the sum of executive salaries. So is that a looping mechanism or no? It, it, it how Haskell okay. interprets it or does what Haskell does with it stays in Haskell's land. I'm thinking in that terms because of the conference in Vegas in October. The, the, what the fold function does is it takes a whole bunch of values in a list and applies a function between each pair of values, getting one value together. And so when I run this code, I get 1,200,000. And I did it without for i equals one, two, blah, 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 for this in that. And if you have a language that doesn't have map, filter, and fold in some form these days, then you've got a pretty peculiar language. Most of them, almost every language has adopted something like this. So what is the significance of fold one? Even if I had a one here? No, it says fold one. Some oh, 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 that's fold L, fold for starting from the left. And there's Thank a fold you. R that folds from the right. Would it matter which one of those you used in this particular case? I'm sorry? Would it matter which one of those you used in this particular case? In this particular case, it wouldn't. It would if I were using minus. If I were subtracting, then... Thank you. Now let's see where I am here. Um, Someone is comparing fold with reduce. Yeah, same thing. Exactly the same thing. 
Now, uh, let's do lambda expressions. Um, this little thing, this backslash, is supposed to be a lambda. Lambda notation was invented by Alonzo Church in a paper in 1932. And this says, on the fly, define a function that takes an x and yields x plus 1, and apply it, in this case, apply it to 7. So the stuff in red is a lambda expression, and it's a way of defining a function on the fly. So we've got a lambda expression here, a brand new function, the add one function, but we don't need to give it a name. And we apply it to seven and we get eight. Um, I got to tell you a little bit about Alonzo Church. He was the advisor of one of my professors in graduate school. He came to Champaign-Urbana and gave a lecture and struck me as the most the most careful person in the world, the most meticulous person in the world. This is a snapshot from one of his books, just a little piece of it. If you notice, each chapter begins with a section number 00, zero and each chapter ends with a sub, sub section named 09. That's not an accident. The next chapter goes from 2-0 to 2-9. The chapter after that goes from 3-0 to 3. Every single chapter is numbered that way. Um, I, I looked at the handwritten notes that he handed out and couldn't tell whether they were handwritten or typed. Um, I believe I read that Kurt was also Alan Turing's thesis advisor. Uh, that may have been true. I'll tell you one thing that I know is, you know that, well, what, what is the essence of Haskell, right? Um, we don't like programs with state in them. So Haskell is the ultimate incarnation of the separation of church and state. <laughs> not, not mine originally, but I just love it. Okay, here we go. Can we get a bada boom? Yeah. Here's another version of the same program that I did earlier using lambda expressions. So in Haskell, um, is it fair to say anywhere that you need you need to pass a function, you could pass a lambda? I think that's fair to say. There might be situations where you're better off for readability not doing it. And is, is it is it? Um, is it well, I don't know. I don't even want to use the word fair here, but can you do anything inside a lambda? You can a normal function in in. Haskell. That clearly is not the case for Python and some other. I, so Python is the only other language I know. Oh, that. there are lots of things you can do here that you can't do in. Yeah. See, I think of Python and. Well, Python is the only language I, I can think of that actually has a Lambda construct. And well, in, Java 8, from Java 8 on does also. Okay. You know that much. And, and in Java, do they. Uh, can you put I mean, anything I mean, in a Lambda that you can put into a function? There's, I mean, Python and Java and languages in that category all have functional features added onto them after the fact. Yeah, and then like JavaScript has, doesn't have Lambdas, but it has uh, true uh, anonymous functions. Yeah. So, um, the sharp has Lambda functions. Who? Yeah. C-sharp, the Microsoft uh, okay. product. But let me just say this. A function is a first-class citizen in this language. And a lambda expression is a function. So you can do an awful lot inside of a lambda expression that you wouldn't be able to do in an imperative language that added lambda expressions. It's a, it's a very... it's. Functions are just not special in this language. 
if I want to put all kinds of lines of code, I don't know, I'm trying to find a place for them. Um, if I want to put pattern matching of all kinds of odd sorts here, I can do it. And part of that pattern matching can involve functions. Now, when you say a function is a first class citizen, to me, that says there would be in some context something called a second class object. I yeah. Mean, it's the so, difference between first right. class and second class. Yeah. So I'm thinking of the, all the languages in which functions are special, they're different from other types. So variables are first class objects in 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 i'll talk java and python a number is a first class citizen a string maybe um a uh, boolean is a first class citizen but a function that has to be treated separately okay if you call a function in c you have to send a pointer to the function I don't remember exactly how that works, but when I say first class citizen, what I mean is in this language, there's no distinction, almost no distinction between functions and other types of things. So when you talk about functions as first class citizens, is that similar to what I've seen uh, in some papers on design patterns? Uh, where they refer to avoiding entanglement not really a great word for this for Public, you mean. <laughs> avoiding entanglement between two uh between two functions whereas you, you don't want one function affecting how another function would run is that kind of the same theory um, of this first class functions i i don't see a connection okay are you able to explain slide 27 um, so this thing here, let's go back to this one, right? Here, you notice how I define salary here? And then I use it on the next line. I mean, don't, don't worry about what the definitions, basically it says pick the last, pick the number 1 million or 200,000 or 50,000, pick that out. And that's what the salary function says here. This is the way I define it on slide 24. The way I define it on slide 27 is this way. The same function, I'm just not giving it a name. Is each line a separate statement? Oh, you know, this is one line. This could be one, one long line. I, I, compress them in order to make it so that I could fit it all on one slide. I, I mean, you know, otherwise I could write over this whole right. blah, 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 So does the indentation mean anything? Yeah, um, like yeah. in, Py in Python, I, I, it's one of the reasons I avoid Python because I, I think things should be done with, you know, the code blocks with curly brackets because I'm old school, but um, uh, Python, uses indentation to denote that. And uh, is there any significance in Haskell, is there any significance to the indentation? And yes. how does it matter what, what you use tabs or spaces or how many or what? Uh, it doesn't matter how many, but um, it does. And I don't think it matters if you use tabs. I never use tabs. Um, but yes, um, things, certain lines have to be indented more than other lines. Could you explain the relationship between fold and then map and then filter? In other words, do those, does the fold operate, how much does the fold operation consume? And is it sending results to the map thing or is this all one? Uh, so it's taking the yeah. list of employees, that's me, Jane and Joe, and then it's filtering for the ones whose middle value is not this word. So then 
this thing here is just the list Barry and Jane. So and the yeah. So what we're looking at is the so the the thing beginning with filter applies this filter function using the lambda function that follows it. Right. To employees. Yes. And the result of that is available to map. Is that exactly exactly? Thank you. And then map says apply the sal the fine salary function to Barry and Jane. And so then it gets a list that contains one million and two hundred thousand. And then it hands that as the third argument to the foldel function, which adds up, starting with zero, one million and twenty thousand, two hundred thousand. I don't want to cheat, Jane. Thank you. Okay. All right. So now what we see here is that. Um, the map function takes a function like um, the um, takes a function like the salary find salary function, and then takes a list and gives you another list. Functions take other functions as their arguments. Again first class citizen. A function can take a function. A function can take a function of functions as its argument. A function can take a function of functions of functions as its argument. Functions are as good as variables. All right, let's be lazy. Uh, you know what, I'm going to, so, so, yeah. If, this program is ex ex executed in Haskell, then this thing will never get evaluated. And the reason it'll never get evaluated is because Haskell realizes that the first argument is one. It says one and anything else is one, and I should have put an underscore here because I didn't even need that variable. And now for those of you who, like me, are fans of all things infinity, um, this thing is the notation for the infinite list that starts at one, goes to two, goes to three, goes to four. If you say print that, it'll run until you see steam coming out of your computer. But because of lazy evaluation, when it says take 10 of the things in here, it doesn't bother calculating more than 10 of them. It seems a little magical. If you go back to that previous slide, um, there's something really amazing going on there. The, the very first line, factorial one equals one, uh, or actually the, the function one, y equals one. Haskell actually has to e evaluate the body of that function to, in order to make that determination. It actually has to, I mean, it's not, it's more, it's beyond a syntax or a semantic. So, theme. so, so I, what I should have put here was an underscore, but it doesn't matter. Right. But I mean, how does it, Haskell has to somehow figure out that that always returns a one, right? I'm telling it that it returns a one. Right. But it's the body of the function. It has to evaluate how it's, how it would execute. Like that's. 
that, 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 that I mean, that goes far beyond what other languages do, I think. Um, I mean, because what if you had what if you had a, a, a complicated uh, expression in there that essentially just always returned one? Would that break Haskell or would it? So would it figure it out? So the rule is that it evaluates nothing that it doesn't have to evaluate. It evaluates nothing that it hasn't been explicitly asked to evaluate. So if I write this expression and I don't say anywhere, what's the value of that? If I if it doesn't need to know the value of that, it does not calculate. And it knows that it doesn't need to know its value because it says, let's see, what's fun of this and that? I don't care what this is or what that is. I just want to pass these two things, whatever they might be, up here and see what happens. So it says, let me see here. One of one, let's see, what was that first argument? Oh, it was a one. Yeah, that's all I need to know. So so Haskell at the very least has to understand why is not being used in the body. Yeah. Okay. All right. And like okay. I said, I could use an underscore there. All right. I'll let it go at that. Oh. Oh, this is a favorite example of mine. Have you have you folks seen the quick sort? It's this it's this massively clever algorithm for sorting a list. George, have you seen it? Oh yes, it's in the Knuth sort of programming. It's it's, I mean. I, I don't hesitate to admit that if I had to write it in Java, it would take me a week. It's maybe about, I don't know, 20 lines or something, but every little less than and greater than, plus one and minus one and index of this, is, and it's just, oh. Here it is in Haskell. If you're trying to sort- plus, plus. Yeah, well, that's that's um, um, concatenate. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to sort the empty list, you just get back the empty list. If you want to sort a list with a head and a tail, put the head in the middle and concatenate it with recursively having quick sorted the values that are less than x and the values that are greater than x. If you've never seen quick sort in an imperative language, then this doesn't may not strike you as being as exciting as I find it. But I mean, this is so incredibly simple compared with what it would look like in a do this, do that type language. List comprehension means if I say filter less than or equal to x, x's, it knows exactly what I mean. And, you know, beautiful stuff. Okay. Well, if I can chip in, the yeah. magic is in filter. Filter is generically doing that for i equals yeah. one to n and figuring that out. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, I guess I'm just going to keep plowing along here. Um, this, this, maybe maybe I won't dwell on this example. Um, um, this is an example of I make a function definition, and this is the only way that I can define the function as the identity. Strong typing. Every, when you write a program in Haskell, if it compiles, it's probably correct because the type system is so strict. I would not be able to do this. If I define f is a function that takes a to a, this would not be legal. And the compiler will tell me so. Let me not go into details about that because can of worms and you know, you're 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 so gracious to be sticking with me all this time. Um, here's input and output.
And I've got a more ex elaborate example later. But let me try to explain a point here. Get line means the same, the exact same thing in every program. It doesn't matter what the context is. Print means exactly the same thing in every program. It doesn't matter what the context is. This operator is called bind. And what it does is it knows how to sift the hidden little changeable value that's embedded inside of getLine and pass it without our referring to it explicitly to print for print to use. That's the sort of magic, it's cheating a little bit, that Haskell does in order to have fully pure functions, immutable expressions when doing input and output. This thing does not stand for the value that you input. This thing does not stand for how many values you were able to output. Encased inside this value somewhere is the number 33. There's no reference to it in this code, to 33. But this operator says, I'm going to take the little 33 or whatever's in here and surreptitiously hand it to print. And print then will surreptitiously do what has to do with it, which is displayed on the screen. And that, my friends, is the essence of what a monad is. A monad is a thing with one of these bind operators. And the bind operator says, there's something inside here. I'm going to put it into here without making reference to it. I believe I recall monads in category theory. It's a mapping from one category to another. Well, that's a morphism, right? Oh, maybe so. Yeah. No, a mor morphism is a mapping from one object to another. Okay. Yeah. No, I, 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 I never said that I didn't like category theory, just that the one the people I know are crazy who do it. And, and, and since you're not a mainly a category theorist, you get to be exempt. <laughs> I think a monad is a category with one object. Okay. Whatever you but, say, boss. I'd have to the term, it, the term, the term it, uses it uses is indivisible. And mean, and in other words, it's, 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 it's everything. everything. Frank, you've got a really big time echo going on. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. It, it, it's, it's in, in the, the, the term they use is indivisible. It's, it's, it is everything, everything in and of itself. itself. Okay. Well, well, it's um, not like, like something containing, containing one. one. It's, it's, it, it, is, is, it is It is all inclusive. inclusive. Okay, let me just, um, here. Um, here's, my, here's my quick explanation of monad. Um, when I stick that, um, that, um, thumb drive into a laptop. If that laptop is a Windows laptop, and if that thumb drive has auto run on it, then Windows knows how to pull out of that thumb drive an executable and start running it. And I don't need to know what the executable is. I don't need to reference it. I don't need to say anything about it. It just happens. So in the same way as something just it just knows how to take quietly the thing on the thumb drive and send it to the computer for processing. In the same way, this bind operation just quietly knows how to take the, the, the thing that GetLine got, whatever that is, and send it to print. That's monads. What if you wanted to take 
your input and assign it to a variable instead of just uh, printing it out. Well, I could do something like this. Now, what's going on here is that we're in the middle of this do notation. And the do notation is sort of a cheat to make some very complicated bind expressions more human readable. So what you're saying you want to do, you could do it with bind, but it really is hard to read when you do it that way. So Haskell has provided us with this notation called do that looks like imperative programming, but it's really shorthand for evaluating this, binding it to this, binding that to this, well, not quite, kind of, sending that to this and sending that to this. And um, we could desugar that and make it look like all like binds um, or, or functions like bind, but this is, this is probably less painless. Um, it, it's, it's, it's doable. And what's happening here is, so this X does, the value of X will change from one run of the program to another, depending on what you get. However, I wouldn't really have to use X if I desugared this, this whole piece of code. And in the meantime, the compiler is checking for me to make sure that I'm using X exactly the way I should. Does that help? And we're, re we're really getting into the weeds here, so. Anna, the fact that you're not saying yes means maybe it didn't help. I'm okay with it. I think. Well, I mean, there's a lot of syntax here, and this is not easy stuff. I, I you so know. is X like fundamentally a different kind of a thing than, say, uh, if I had X equals five, then I would call X a variable. I have X left arrow get line. Is X a variable? Yeah, it's a variable and its value varies. And, and the only thing that saves us from having this variable that this mutable value here is that the compiler checks to make sure that we're using it correctly. And we really could do without it if we were willing to write this thing out in its long form, in its extended form. Okay. And I think what you have here, oh, I was going to say this is the most practical program that I can show you, but no, I got another one. You asked about CSV. I did. I didn't quite I didn't quite understand your question, but I just cooked up this code. This is the definition of a what we call a, a course class in another language. Um, let's just call it a course type here. I define a function on it, and the function takes the department and the number, course number, and the title, and puts commas between them. Now I'm sure that's not. Oh, I didn't. I didn't put the um, output. The output is a line. Oh wait. Well, I was really asking about reading the CSV file. Yeah, 
that's harder, but it's, but it's, I can show it to you. I can show it to you. Um, um, you know, I can exchange that information with you. Is data a keyword? Yes. It's defining a new type. Let me see where I am here. Oh, I've got two more slides. How about that? Okay. Thank you for sticking with me so far. Um, lots of languages have adopted this thing, something like this called the maybe, maybe monad. The idea of the maybe monad is you take a value that may or may not exist, you pass it on to a function, you take go from that function to another function, from that function to another function. If anywhere along the chain you end up with a value that doesn't exist, the system automatically says, I can deal with that. I'm not going to make you a null pointer error. I'm just going to call it nothing. If I receive nothing, I give back nothing. So f takes something that may have a square root and sends that square root to something that may have a reciprocal. So I'm going to take the square root of 4. And the reciprocal of it is 1 over 2, which is 5. But I'm not going to get a reciprocal of 0. So without doing anything else, if statements are taking care of null, I get nothing. And if I choke on the square root, then it says nothing to recip maybe. And recip maybe says, eh, you gave me nothing. I'll return nothing. And this pattern, um, lots of languages have it now. In Java, it's called optional. The million dollar mistake, right? Null. Or a billion dollar mistake? Is the word just a keyword? Yes. Actually, I take that back. It's not a keyword, it's a word that's defined in the libraries, but it's you know, it's it's there. You wouldn't you wouldn't want to use another word. I mean, you can, but but you'd have to redefine the maybe monad. Okay, and so how does the just op, the, the how does that work? So you remember I said that there's you've got this container when you have a monad and there's a thing in it like the value that you just read from the keyboard, right? Yeah. It's like there's a program on the thumb drive and you don't make reference to it, but it's in there. Yeah. So just 0 0.5 says I've got a 0.5 and it's inside of a box. It's well contained inside of a box that is called the just box, the, the just monad. And if you're understanding what I'm saying, you're way ahead of the game here, because this is, this is difficult stuff. A million people have written articles on how monads work to the point where people who do Haskell make fun of all of those of us who have written articles, and justifiably so. Uh, the famous one is where somebody called, compared a, a, a monad to a, a burrito, and everybody laughs about it. But I mean, this is, this is very difficult to explain. The, the idea is the same way that get line was a container for an input value, just is a container for a number that I calculated. So how does it differ from 0.5? Ah, it's the difference between having 0.5 and having 0.5 inside of a box. How, how does... Um, the number five differ from the list that contains five. Well, I know what a list is, and I know what the number is, and depending on the language, I think I know what that means. But I'm not. I since I haven't studied Haskell, I'm trying to understand what the box is that constitutes the monad. 
by which you label it just. Would you believe me if I said that brackets five, the list containing five, what that really is, is five inside of the list monad. Okay, fine. In other words, is no, a zero point five. Can you multiply that by anything? No, nope. you have to. You have to send it. You have to find it, pipe it to a function that takes a monad and sucks the five out of it. So you, you mentioned that or, this is one of the mechanisms Haskell uses to get around the whole immutable variable yeah. thing. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, what does just zero point five mean? I'm going to be flippant and say it means whatever they define it to mean. It, it's it's hard to it's hard to it's hard to put a visualization thing on it. It's just like the same way that the list containing five isn't quite the same as five. Just five isn't the same as five, and the only kind of meaning for just is it's a box. And if you see just 0 0.5, you know that it's going to follow the rules of the maybe monad. I know, I know that doesn't, I know that doesn't do it. Yeah. Does just warn you that the whatever's there is the result of some processing that involved the a variant variable. In other words, the re, in the rest of the program, the number is the, the the value of the variable is always the same. Is this just telling you that this is something that can vary over time? Not really. What it's telling you is that this number is inside, and I keep using this word box, it's, it's inside this, this container, and that to deal with it, I have to do something like send it with this function. OK, so one way I've thought of this uh, monad uh, situation business is that um, you're kind of modulating back and forth between two realms, like two categories. You're going from the real world, which is actual values of numbers and things, and you're going back and forth. Think of like a layer, another layer where it goes to a wrapped version of that entity, which can be uh, uh, augmented by various things like logging and, you know, whatever, checking the, the correctness. And then you can also, then you can modulate back to the real world. Um, that's kind of the way I think of it. Like, like you're doing calculations maybe in the real world and then you modulate them back to the, the uh, other dimension and do other things and then modulate them back. Is, that's kind of the way I'm thinking about it. You're here. I, I think it is just a container yeah. that that validates the container never changes, so it meets the rules of immutability, and it can only be uh, it has to be connected to some service that knows how to deal with the content behind the scenes, so to speak. Exactly. This thing says, "I'm going to hand it to something that can deal with." X and give me another box. Give me another. Hey. Yeah, I'm looking up the definitions. It's basically that's the thing. It pipes, uh, uh, turn mm -hmm. complicated sequences of functions into succinct pipelines that abstract away control flow and side effects. Oh, there you go. Perfect. I, so yeah. the wrapping, the wrapping is th where you were going with the wrapping is 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 where they were going with it because you, you can then wrap it. 
I mean, I, I uh, um, what was it? InfoQ talked me into writing an article about this. And, you know, after reading my article, I didn't get it right. I mean, it's just, it's just, once you understand, it's like riding a bike. Yeah. Once you understand it, good. But then. So it's, it's actually kind of similar to pipes in Unix or Linux. Yeah. Yeah. Functions just have a background system that know how to connect them together. So. Yeah. So very quickly, the, the full moon is rising over Chicago. So if you take a quick look at my video, I'm going to move it in a second. Oh, that's cool. It's a beautiful sky. Very nice. Sorry, sorry for the interruption. No, 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 no. I like interruptions. Um, yeah, I, I spent the last 10 minutes apologizing for not being able to explain monads. But I think some of, I mean, I think we're getting there. Um, and um, I'm proud of you folks. Um, it's um, it, it's a tough time. And pipes. I mean, it, pipes is a good is a good way of thinking about it. Imagine though taking the notion of a pipe and just generalizing to, it to anything in the universe that has certain qualities that a that a Unix pipe has. That's that's kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey just made it funny. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. All right. I'm sorry, I just got a look. Hey, hey, hey there may. Uh, all right, okay. <laughs> uh, one more slide. I don't know if this will. Um... There's this function fix. And I, I mean, when I encountered it, I just couldn't believe it. Here's the definition of it fix on a function yields the value x, where f of x equals x. It finds a fixed point of a function. And um, here's a definition of factorial. And when you look for the fixed point of that definition, you actually end up by some magic doing the recursion. I don't know. I've seen articles about this too, how this works. It's, it's, um, well, anyway, I mean, I, you know, um, um, I, I, I guess I started by making fun of category theorists. Um, people who work with Haskell are smart. And, and, and I mean, people who work with it seriously, not just us people who teach it and can, you know, explain it on a, Low level here. Um, on a, on a, on a, what I know of it is elementary, um, and there's a lot more to know. And it's just an incredibly rich subject with a very, very rich history. Um, there's all kinds of things in Haskell that are magical. Um, this is one of them, and there are there, there are many, many others. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I am Barry Bird from Drew University. And if you wanna get in touch with me, please feel free to do so. Just mention that you saw this video. So I know that you're not coming from outer space to ask me questions, barry at bird.org. And uh, thank you. And if you have any more questions, hey, I'm here. Thanks, Barry, that was amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to give a shout out to my partners and patrons. Frank Stowicki and Bruce Lang are my partners. My VIP patrons are Laura Hees and Carrie Scratton. If you want to get involved, uh, the website is quantumwithanna.com. It has all about me and how to get involved. Thank you.